Hey guys, uh, let me just begin with a few uh, caveats, basically. Uh, I know that uh, I've got a longer slot to present this in. Uh, I am not going to take 90 minutes to, to do this video for you. Uh, my, my idea here is more to kind of give you the, the sense of the story that I'll be telling, um, but um, when I do it live, I'll do it more slowly, more carefully, and I'll be trying to produce uh, a little bit more interaction with, with the audience. So. I'll let the whole thing breathe um, and you know I'm always pretty good at watching the time and working within the time I have and, and using that um, and so I yeah, just throw that caveat out there um, but for now what I what I again want to do is just kind of walk you through the slides give you a sense of the storyline um, and I may do that uh, much more quickly and efficiently than I otherwise would okay so I like to start by just showing uh, people these words and saying you know, without using your electronic devices or notepad or anything, just look at these words and try your very best to remember as many of them as you can. Now, as a, as a funny thing, when I've used this in the past, people have told me afterwards that I have a typo. Is it tetanus? Is tetanus typo? So anyway, I'll, I'll look at that, but if you guys see a typo, uh, it must be tetanus. I'll have to look at how that's spelled. Um, let me know. Um, cause some people find it distracting or they think it's part of the experiments and kind of not. All right. So everyone's looked at those words for a little while, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. So, um, a lot of what I'm, uh, going to talk about is, is memory in what I think is a really complete sort of high level way that hopefully will make people really understand the processes. And so one of the things, uh, one of the contexts that I'll be using to kind of show the overall power of memory is this notion of the judicial hunch. Um, you know, a, a judge sitting in on a case and hearing facts come in and those facts reminding them of, of previous cases. So memory starting to go, oh yeah, I've seen this before. Um, and pushing the judge to start assuming certain things are true or not true. And so obviously, you know, this is something that you guys are told to avoid. Um, but I want to kind of, you know, use that as one context to say, you know, is this a good thing that the brain does this? Is it a bad thing? Or is it something you just can't avoid? Is it just something the brain does? Uh, so that's one of the contexts we're going to talk about. Um, by the end of all this, I really hope that you will have a deeper understanding of, of memory in general, how it connects with decision making, and how all of this really reflects what, what I consider a very, very basic um, propensity of the mind. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what you're, what we're going to cover and what you, hopefully you will leave this session with, you will get a sense that the mind is obsessed with making things make sense. Uh, and that when it defines makes sense, it's kind of a memory definition that, that the current things I'm witnessing fit with things I've seen in the past. So you'll have a strong um, sense and lots of uh, examples of the mind doing this. Uh, you will see that the mind is inherently decisive it does not sit on the fence. Uh, it wants to be in a very firm state and it does not like ambiguity very well and it fights against ambiguity. Um, you will really will dig in a little bit to the role that memory plays in terms of making sense of stuff, the sense making process. Um, and sometimes it's memory that we're trying to make sense of. Uh, and so sometimes there's sort of a meta level where memory is both the target of what we're trying to make sense of. Um, and it's also helping us make sense of that thing. So <laughs> hey, how's that sound for complicated? Um, and finally, the process that memory uses to make sense is the same as is used for decision making and is prone to the same issues. Uh, and so, you know, the issues that I will highlight, you will see are, are general issues. Uh, they are a result of how the mind works. Uh, and so how can you ensure if, this is, if these are tendencies of the mind, and if you think these tendencies could get in the way of rational decision-making, what can you do to try to keep your decisions as rational as possible? So I'll, I'll have some discussion about that at the end. All right, so cool, let's jump in. Um, so I'm gonna highlight, and you'll see these numbers every now and then, certain central points uh, that, that I really want you to take from this. And uh, the first one is all going to be about making sense, that things make sense to the mind when they match up with previous mental experiences. And if they don't completely match, and they never do, the brain has ways of enhancing the match. OK, 
Okay, so you'll let's just dive into that. So we're going to be at a very general level here. Um, and sometimes I like to start with this quote from uh, Dan, Dan Brown's book, Origin. Uh, in this book, he's got a figure who is uh, an Elon Musk kind of figure, a futurist who is, you know, constantly pushing the bounds of technology and, and knowledge. Um, and this futurist at one point uh, is giving a presentation. And as a professor, by the way, one of the reasons professors like Dan Brown is it's one of the few books where professors get to be the heroes. Uh, so that's always kind of cool. Uh, but it's also fascinating to professors because they often include situations where a character in the book is um, giving a class or giving a presentation. Uh, and there's things to learn. It's kind of interesting to see how a, an author you know, imagines these presentations. And so they're always very dramatic and they're interesting. And so here's one that this Elon Musk, and his name's actually Edmund, here's, here's what he, he's talking about the brain, basically. And he says, the brain is like an organic computer. Your brain has an operating system, a set of rules that organizes and defines all of the chaotic input that flows in all day long. Language, a catchy tune, a siren, the taste of chocolate. As you can imagine, the flow of information is frenetically diverse and relentless, and your brain must make sense of it all. In fact, it is the very programming of your brain that defines your sense of reality. And he goes on to say, if you could look at the human mind and read its operating system, it would look something like this. Despise chaos, create order. This is what your brain does. Um, we live in, in a really chaotic world. Um, we very seldom, even the objects in the world, very seldom are we presented with an entire object. It's almost always occluded by other things or you know, it has light on one side and shadow on the other. There's always a whole bunch of, in a sense, noise. Uh, the, the world is hitting us with all these sights and sounds, none of them complete. It's really a mess. But it doesn't seem like a mess to us. It seems like a stable, structured, sensical world. Why? Because the brain is programmed to eliminate chaos and create order. And that's what we end up seeing. So I want to give you some examples of this. Um, one is from language. Can you read the sentence below? So um, I, I would normally just pick people in the audience and say, please, please read this. And very quickly, they can say, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are, the sentence is still readable. Uh, so this is one example how we can perturb a stimulus pretty much. You know, if you look at the word matter, for example, it's a mess there. But because the letters of the word matter are there and because it kind of fits in a grammatical sequence that does make sense, the brain has seen things like this before a little bit. This isn't exactly what the brain has seen before, but it basically turns it into something that makes sense. And so we can very easily decode these kinds of things. So that's a language example. Uh, here's another one, and I'll usually get people to read this one. And almost every time, occasionally this doesn't work for me, but almost every time they will say, I love Paris in the springtime. And hopefully some of you, when you're looking at that, you think it says, I love Paris in the springtime. Uh, however, it does not. Uh, it actually says, well, what do you think? Take another look. Take another look. So sometimes I'll do this and it's kind of fun because sometimes an audience member is just shaking their head and, and they don't know what I mean. They say, it says, I love Paris in the springtime. Until you say, no, what it actually says is, I love Paris in the, the springtime. There's two thes. Um, and, and people just get rid of one. Why? Does it make sense to have two thes? Uh, the saying is, I love Paris in the springtime. And so the brain knows that saying, it's encountered it before, and you know it, it eliminates one of the thes. We don't see it. We get order, not chaos. So you know these are already two examples of the brain taking input and then doing stuff with it. In the left example, it's restructuring the letters of the word, in a sense. In the right example, it's just deleting a word altogether that doesn't seem to belong there. So these are language examples, but I want to claim that this is not a language thing. This is a brain thing. This is a mind thing. So here are a couple of examples. Okay, so yeah, so one of the things that I do if, if we want to do the Paris in the, the, the springtime in a larger way is I ask them this, right? And most people will say, I love Paris in the springtime. So most people will say six. They'll pick option two. And, and what we'll see if we do this on a group level is that more people will pick option two 
then we'll pick option three. Option three is actually the correct one because there's two thus. Okay, so just another way of demonstrating that. Okay, so if we move beyond language and we go into perception, um, well, what's this? Uh, and I can usually ask an audience member and they can very quickly say, um, this is Judge Judy. Okay, you guys are primed, of course. She's a famous judge. I don't know what you guys think of Judge Judy, but, but there she is. Um, but when you really look at it, is she there? Well, yeah, she's there, but she's, you know, um, uh, I've put all this stuff over this, made it, you know, disguising. I've got lines across, I got bubbles, I've got this sort of grading pattern on top of things. There really isn't that much of Judge Judy there, uh, but there's enough. When the brain sees that, it tries to figure out what it's seeing and it finds something in memory that kind of fits. And then as it does so, this starts to resemble that. And at some point we can pull the Judge Judy out of this chaos. Despise chaos, create order. So very simple perceptual example. Um, here's another one. Um, how many objects are there here? So I will, I will ask that sometimes. When you look at this, and, and don't get too analytical, just look at it. And if you had to describe what you're seeing in, in a sentence, let's say, a sentence that described what objects you were seeing, uh, how many objects would you be referring to? Okay, the vast majority of people, and I think we have one of these questions here, yeah. The vast majority of the people would say, okay, so the, the way I say it here is, what did you see? Okay, what do you see when you look at that? What do you actually see? And, and most people will pick here um, two trying, uh, no, hang on. Two triangles arranged on three circles. Yeah, number one. Wow, this is a lot to kind of look at and, and decompose. I could just ask them how many objects they see. I'll think about that. Um, but what you actually see, the critical point is what you actually see are, yes, two triangles on top of three circles. That one triangle, the top triangle, you know, to even use that term, to talk about the top triangle, the top triangle does not actually exist. Um, there is no parts of it actually out there. What you really, what I've really presented here, what this really is, is three of these little greater than or less than signs, you know, these little, these little things, and three Pac-Men. Okay, that's really what's there. But when you present it this way, we don't see a lot of Pac-Men in the real world. We don't see a whole lot of greater than or less than signs at weird angles. But we do see a lot of circular objects. They're all over the place. And triangles are not all that uncommon either. So to us, to our brain, it's much easier to see this as this white triangle with a white outline on top of a triangle with a black outline and also on top of, th of three circles. And so we start to see la a line, what we call an illusory contour there. And if you actually zoomed in on this part, let's say, of the screen, and you tried to see if there's any difference above or below or around that line, there's nothing. There's no line there. But the brain fills it in because that's the simplest way to make sense of what it's seeing. Okay? Perception example. It's true of perception. It's true of language. And what I'm gonna show you is that it's true of memory as well. So just to kind of capture this, when the brain tries to make sense, it will, it will manipulate the input. Um, it will assume information or ignore information or restructure information, do what it has to do to make sense of what it's seeing. And the definition of make sense itself is almost, well, is very memory based. So the process that it uses to make sense is one that's heavily influenced by memory. It wants what it's currently seeing to match up with concepts that it has in its mind, and it has those concepts because it's encountered them in the past, right? So memory is at play. All right, cool. Um, right, somebody wanted to, someone wanted to ask about the implicit association task. So, so I, will, uh, I, I will mention that as an example of um, these powerful effects that memory can have and how they're used. So let me just tell you the, the um, experiment first of all. So we have a participant and ultimately, this, this is actually showing you the first screen, um, but ultimately there will be a second stimulus. So you'll see a quick flash of a face that could either be, in this case, an African-American face or a Caucasian face. 
that's shown quickly and now it's followed by in the most simplest form sometimes it's followed by the word good or bad uh, and you have to say quite quite quickly um, if it's the word good, you press one button that says it's the word good. If it's the word bad, you press another button that says it's the word bad. So that's your task is just which word am I showing you, good or bad? But right before it, we flash one of these faces. And what people have found is that for your typical Caucasian participant, that if you flash an African-American face first rather than a Caucasian, then they will be slower to respond good to good, and they will be faster to respond bad to bad. It's like they are primed to want to say bad. If you show them a Caucasian face, now they're faster to say good and slower to say bad. It's like that face primes them um, to want to say good. Uh, and so this is, by the way, an approach that's been used to measure um, prejudice. And, and the interesting thing about that um, is that, you know, if you think about it, you cannot, well, you can, but it's awful hard to measure prejudice directly. You can't, if you ask somebody, you know, are you prejudiced? Um, we all know the right answer. And the right answer is no. Or if, or if you're Donald Trump, it's I am the least prejudiced person in this entire galaxy, whatever. Um, you know, that that's what we all know we should say. Um, and so we usually, you know, won't be all that honest, even if we do feel like we're going to be a little bit more honest about some of our feelings, we still probably would bound them a little bit if we were asked very explicitly to, to say these things out loud. Uh, but the idea is this task, the amount to which, for example, a black face primes you to say bad, um, is thought to be related to the extent to which you hold prejudicial beliefs. So, so we can actually, you know, the source of that is assumed to be the sort of stereotype you might have about that race. That's where the priming is coming from. And so if you're seeing more priming, you probably hold that stereotype more strongly. So it's an implicit way. So you see this, the implicit associate task. It's also sometimes called the implicit attitude test um, because the, the idea is that this provides us a way of measuring prejudice in an implicit way. Um, it also demonstrates, you know, what, what I'm trying to say in a, in a different way, that, that that memory, the memories that these things trigger um, affect this very simple bad or good decision that, you know, already that's enough to, to kind of trigger the way we look at the word bad or good. Um, and so these memory is always there. It's every time we're dealing with anything, we're dealing through. We're dealing with it through a filter of memory. So this makes it really tricky because, you know, some of these things I'm going to tell you about, some of these memory effects, they are happening at a very unconscious level in some cases. And so that's going to make it even harder to control. All right. Let's talk about prejudice for a while because it's, it's going to be connected to some of the thoughts of memory. Prejudice is actually... Um, a, a very uh, basic algorithm, let me not say prejudice, let, let, me say, let me say it this way. The brain always wants to predict what's coming next. And it likes to know how to behave in certain situations. It likes to know what behaviors will lead to rewards and what behaviors will lead to punishments. And it uses stereotypes. It creates stereotypes and it uses them to help it know the right way to behave in a situation that's new but is similar to something from the past, something it knows about. So let's just talk about these stereotypes, how they were created back in the day, the sort of evolutionary day and the role they served, and then you know, how things are kind of messed up in the current world and how this connects to the, the topic of prejudice. Okay, so let, let's get something a little bit more generic, um, less charge. So, so let's say the following thing. You've been to restaurants. You know some restaurants are sort of sit-down restaurants where a waiter comes over and takes your order and does all that kind of thing. 
Other restaurants are fast food restaurants. You just, you walk in, there's a menu in front of you, you see stuff, you decide what you want to order, you pay right away, you get your food, take it back to the seat yourself. So very different behaviors in those two things, right? And you wouldn't want to mix them up. You wouldn't want to go into a fast food restaurant and just sit down in a chair and wait for a waiter. You'd be waiting a long time. Uh, you also probably wouldn't want to go to a sit-down restaurant and walk right up to the kitchen and tell them what you want. Um, you know, either case, you would be seen as an odd individual. Uh, and we don't like to be seen as odd individuals. We like to be seen as highly competent, prof proficient individuals. So stereotypes help us do that. And so the idea is just this. Let's say you've been to McDonald's. Let's say you've been to Wendy's um, and, and, you know, et cetera. And let's say, of course, you've been to Tim Hortons. You're a Canadian. Uh, and now, for whatever reason, you're introduced to a brand new fast food restaurant. Um, let's say an Arby's. Let's say you've never been to an Arby's. So what do you do? And let's say you're all alone. You just decide, oh, there's an Arby's. I've never been to an Arby's. And you don't even know what an Arby's is. You, you've just never been and you're not sure. But the moment you walk in the door, you notice that it has attributes that you have seen before. So it has, you know, a counter with a cash register and a person standing behind it and a big menu across the back. That's what they also had in Wendy's and McDonald's and Tim Hortons. Uh, and so the idea is in those Wendy's and McDonald's and Tim Hortons, you formed a stereotype of what a fast food restaurant looks like. They're not all identical, but they have certain features that are common and commonly repeated. And that's what your stereotype kind of, that's part of what your stereotype holds is, you know, what defines something as being part of this class of thing, fast food restaurant. And so when you walk into Arby's, that stereotype helps you connect with that and go, ah, this is a fast food restaurant. The other thing stereotypes contain are this notion of, of the proper behaviors, right? You've learned in fast food restaurants over time, the, we sometimes call this a script, the script you are to follow. You know, what role are you to play uh, and how will things play out if you follow your, your role? So that is, it kind of says, oh, you're in a fast food restaurant. Well, here's what you do. You don't have to look like some moron walking around or sitting down waiting for a, you know, a server to come. Uh, you immediately recognize this as a fast food, food restaurant and you know your role and your role is to, you know, stand in line if you have to stand in line, but walk up to that cash register, order your food, you know, look at the menu, figure out what you want, order your food, etc. Even though you've never been here before, you know how to behave effectively um, and look competent. And that's what stereotypes would do. It would even work with people, cultural groups. So let's say you go to a Japanese restaurant. Well, you know, if, if you've never been to a Japanese restaurant, you may make a bunch of mistakes. Um, you may walk in with your shoes on. You may be asking for a chair. You know, things where we're in a Japanese restaurant, they leave their shoes outside, etc. cetera. Um, but you have to learn these peculiarities of interacting with different cultures. But once you start to build up some notion of the Japanese culture, for example, you get some experience. Then you get these stereotypes and the stereotypes can even be towards people, right? Oh, for a Japanese person, you might bow instead of shaking a hand. There may be certain cultural ways of interacting with other Japanese people. And so you kind of learn that. And in the future, if you're interacting with a Japanese person that you've never met before, um, you know, and, and have had no experience with, and yet you've had experience with Japanese people and you've learned and created stereotypes that can help you effectively interact with this Japanese person, right? You can do the right things. You can bow in the right way and etc. cetera. Um, so the brain uses stereotypes all the time to help it look competent and to make these quick unconscious decisions that make somebody look fluent and not, you know, like they're thinking about things all that hard. So it's a very powerful thing. Um, but of course it can also lead and does also lead to prejudice. Um, and, and sometimes that's worse because the information that builds up our stereotypes is not just personal experience. So these stereotypes were meant to be created based on experiences we've had. But now we have all these artificial experiences. We have movies, we have TV shows, we have information we learn on the internet, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And sometimes they're biased. You know, if, if you're a young Middle Eastern male who really wants to be an actor, 
you can be an actor. You can get the roles as long as you're happy with terrorist. You know, as long as that's the role you're happy with, then then we can give you that role. That's what we tend to see most Middle Eastern men depicted as in movies and such. And so if we see that a lot and we see the way these people uh, act in movies, we can do the same thing I talked about with the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Japanese person, where, where we develop this notion of, oh, that's the way they behave, that's the way they think, that's the way they act. And then when we subsequently meet a man of Middle Eastern background, it's the same thing, right? We might be fearful of them. We might believe certain things about them. Um, and if those things that were portrayed are not true, now we have false stereotypes. Uh, and false stereotypes very often feed prejudice. Um, if a certain group is systematically depicted uh, in, a, in a certain way, that's inaccurate, then those inaccuracies can become part of society because you know some of these biased information sources hit all of society. Okay, so kind of a, a long way, but 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 we're going to use this issue of stereotypes every now and then, and and it's another example of you know how the brain does things, how how it deals with uncertainty and ambiguity. It doesn't like uncertainty and ambiguity. It likes things clear um, and finds ways to make things clear. Okay, so. We have a sense of that. Let me kind of continue the story then with the second critical point. So the brain wants things to make sense and it tries to find ways to do it. Um, the brain is also not a fence sitter. So very early in the ev evolutionary cycle, um, fence sitters got eaten. If you, if you had to spend too much time arriving at some decision Quite often, the decisions in those days were literally life or death decisions. Um, there's some sound, there's some smell, you better act now or you're going to be somebody's dinner. Uh, so sometimes decisions must be made quickly uh, and therefore you can't get stuck too long in a decision. You have to decide what to do and it seems as though the brain has created a process that prevents it from being a fence sitter. Um, and, and it really does not like to be in any intermediary stage. Okay, so just to give you a feel for that, here's a picture of a woman. How old do you think she is? If I give you these categories, take a look at that woman, think about it a little bit. How old do you think that woman is? What we will see, so we'll do, we'll do one of these questions here. Right, turning point one. Um, but what we will see is that we will see two distinct clusters of answers. There will be a bunch of people who pick number two. And there will be a bunch of people who pick, well, four or five. One of, the, one of these two, probably five. Um, but some will be generous and go more four. Uh, okay, what is going on there? This is what's called an ambiguous figure. And we like these in psychology. Um, this can be seen as either a young woman or as a much older woman. Uh, it's very hard to see both at the same time. You can go from, from one to the other, and I'm gonna try to guide you in doing that right now, um, but that's sort of the point, that once I show you how to go from one to the other, you'll be able to do it, but then try to, be, then try to see both, and you kind of can't. Okay, so let me start with the young woman. So for the young woman, she is, let me first give you the sense. So she is kind of looking over her shoulder. So it's kind of like she's facing one way. I, I may not get the angle right here. So, so she's facing this way, but looking over her shoulder, over like that. So if you think of it that way, this line right here is her jaw line. And this would be her ear. So, you know, as I look over my shoulder, you see a jaw line and an ear here. Uh, and so, See her is her jawline, her ear. This is her nose. This is like an eyelash. And of course, this is her hair. And she's got some sort of scarf or something on. This, by the way, would be a necklace around her neck because this is her neck coming down here. Whoops, sorry. Um, so first thing I always have to do is just wait for people for a while. Look at that. Hopefully they get it. jawline, ear. With enough work, usually you can see that. Okay. Now, what about the other woman? The other woman uh, is an older woman, and she's kind of sitting like this with her chin tucked into her, her jacket. 
Um, so she's got a big fur coat on it. She's got her chin tucked in. In fact, this is her chin. And this is her mouth. And this is a big honking nose. All right, so she's got a big nose and a mouth with a chin here kind of tucked in. This is an eye. Um, and this is sort of the eyelash on the other side. You, I mean, again, her nose is huge. I'm not sure what that little growth is on her nose, but it, you know, whatever. Um, it is what it is. So usually that's enough that people can see that woman. Uh, and that's the woman that I'm saying they all say is, if they're nice, 46 to 60, they'll probably say 60, older than 60 years old. So it's an ambiguous stimulus. It can be seen in two different ways, and hopefully you can see both. Can you see both at once? Or do you see your mind kind of go from one to the other? Um, it's, you know, this, is, this uses something called introspection, kind of watching what's happening in your mind, which is always a, a controversial process for learning about the mind. But, um, but I think it makes that point. You know, the, the brain wants to see this one way or the other, and it can move back and forth, but it just doesn't like to hang around in the middle. It can't really see it as neither, either, right? It wants to see it one way, it wants to see it the other, moves back and forth as it does so. This is another very famous example of that, by the way, which is the Necker cube. Um, this is a cube where, and this will mess your head up when it happens to you, it'll reverse in your mind. You'll see it one way and it'll suddenly pop to another way. So it's much more dramatic than the male-female thing. So let me try to walk you through this and then I'll, I'll remove the blue screen, which will hopefully help me. But let's, let's try to do it without removing first. I'm gonna trace a square right here, okay? So I'm tracing a square with my mouse. This square, try to see this as close to you. This is the closest surface to you of a cube. And then that cube goes back to the it goes backwards and to the right, okay? So it kind of goes backwards and to the right. So this is the front. It just flipped on me, which makes it hard for me. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, literally. Uh, so if you see the front and you see it go backwards that way. Now, the other way to see it, one of these will fit for you, and the other one you'll say, what the hell is the guy talking about? But the other way to see it is this. I'm going to trace it a different curve, or a different uh, surface now, different square. So now see this square as the front most. Ah, okay, there it is. This square is the frontmost, and then the cube receding away from you. Can I, can I do that? With yeah, there it is, okay. <laughs> it's really hard, man, but when it happens, it'll be cool. Uh, yeah, so you see that other square as the closest surface to you, and now the cube is going back, backwards and sort of down to the left, whereas in the first one, it's going backwards and sort of up to the right. Um, yeah. Hopefully most of you guys are getting this. And, and the really cool thing with this Necker cube is you stare at it long enough and you will be able to see both and you will be able to flip it. You'll see one and then you'll suddenly see the other. It turns out this is linked to IQ, by the way. People with a higher IQ are better at, at, at doing this, whatever that is, that flipping perspectives on, on this cube. But again, the big point I want you guys to get from here is that the brain will see it one way or see it the other, but it literally, you can almost feel it snapping into one way or snapping to the other way. It does not want to hang around in the middle. It wants to see this as something that, well, once again, makes sense. This is all part of the brain making sense and things in the middle don't make sense to it. Um, and so it makes it make sense uh, by seeing it one way or the other that are sensical and not seeing it in a way that doesn't. Okay, this all relates, I'm giving you, you're getting a little taste of psychology that I'll connect here, to Piaget's notion of accommodation and assimilation. So I want, I want to really ultimately show you the process that the brain is using um, when it does this. So let me just start with this story. Um, young kid, hasn't interacted with cats very much. Let's say this is the first cat that it really had the chance to interact with. And the owner of the cat said, hey, this is a very good cat, very nice cat. Um, go over and, and you know scruff his head or something. And so the kid comes over and he rubs his head a little bit and rubs his ears a little bit and the cat starts to purr and rub up against it and, and great experience for all. Kid enjoys it, made a new friend, excellent. A little while later, kid is somewhere else and sees this cat. So Piaget says, it, the kid probably learned something from the first experience. It learned a little bit about cats and how they behave. <clears throat> and 
And now when it sees this one, even though this does not look exactly like that one, it shares a whole lot of features. So the stereotype concept is here as well, right? Shares a whole lot of features. And the first thing a child will tend to do is um, something called assimilation. So it kind of formed this cat category and this knowledge about cats based on this. And now it will assume that what's true of that is true of this. It'll say, I think this is one of those things. I think it's a cat. Um, and so I'm gonna to behave to it. It's, it's, it is the stereotype. It's the same kind of idea, right? I know how to, be, I learned ways to behave that led to reward. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna scruff this cat behind the ears and I'm gonna scruff his head. And let's say he purrs and he, he we're, we're just gonna assume happy cats for this. I know they're not all happy, but we're gonna assume happy. So he does all these nice things. Okay, excellent, another great experience. A little while later, child sees this cat, same idea. He will accommodate, sorry, assimilate this critter into his cat family. He will behave towards it like a cat and assuming it gives the same rewards, everything's great. And now we're getting this more general category of catness where the child is realizing, oh, there's all sorts of different specific features, but there's this general notion of how to behave towards a cat, how they'll tend to behave back. And then the cat, then the kid sees this and, uh oh, we got a problem here. It's kind of cat-like, right? Kind of looks like a cat, similar. Um, let's say the child has never seen one of these before. Yeah, the paint job's a little different. Yeah, some of the features are a little different, but four legs, tail, little head, body, ears, kind of looks like a cat. Piaget said, first thing it would likely do is assimilate it. Yeah, I think this is a cat. And if the kid is so unwise as to go and treat it like a cat, um, what it will find out is it's not a cat. <laughs> it reacts differently. It would turn and spray the kid and horrible things would result. And at that point, the child will learn something very important. It will learn, oh, there's some sort of category boundary here. This is not one of those. I cannot just assimilate this into the cat family. I must accommodate. I must accommodate the fact that this is different. So I must start creating a different category for this thing and things that are a lot like this thing. And I have to be very careful to not cross the boundary and assume this is one of those. Okay. So now you're going to see something as a cat or a skunk. Okay. A little bit of a process of accommodation. This is sort of how stereotypes are built up too. Right. Okay, cool. What I want to do is give you the process. So let's say in the future, this child, after a bunch of interactions with cats and skunks, comes to something that's ambiguous. Now, I tried to find my best skunk cat on the internet. Um, this is the best I could do. It's not a very good skunk, I'm afraid. Um, so what I would like you to do is use your imaginations a little bit and imagine it's a much more ambiguous stimulus, that it could be a cat, it could be a skunk, you're not sure. And so what I would really want to emphasize here are sort of well, the sort of processing that happens, you know, very initially when you look at that thing, the powerful process is coming from the real world into some sort of mental representation you're forming. So you're starting to get data from the real world telling you what's out there. And we can imagine this data kind of various parts of the data stream being cat-like, other parts of the data stream are more skunk-like. And so you're getting this sort of mixed information where some of, some of the features that that thing look like a cat some of it looked like a skunk. Um, and so this is you know, telling you what's really out in the world and, and what's really out in the world is ambiguous. Uh, and so it's giving you this mixed thing. So what do you do um, in order to you know, not be consumed by the ambiguity? Um, and and you know, what do you assume this next part is, for example? Well, over time we start to get another thing happening that we call, well, convergence and consensus. So eventually this starts to be the focus of processing, not this. So rather than what's in the real world, it's kind of like, okay, I've sampled the real world. Now I need to make sense of the real world. And so I need to fill in parts that I'm not sure about. And how do I do that? Well, I kind of uh, get convergence from the bits I have. So, so I've got some bits, some are cat-like and some are skunk-like, but I got a whole lot more cat-like bits than I have skunk-like bits. And so it starts revisiting this internal representation and forcing it to reach a consensus. 
It's kind of saying you cannot be both cat and skunk at the same time, or it cannot be both cat and skunk. It's got to be one or the other, and we got to figure out which it is. And so this starts to get downplayed. The information coming from the external world starts to get downplayed. The representations I've formed start to become very dominant, and there's this internal process that forces this to become one or the other. It's forcing consensus. Um, and so whichever thing was originally represented most powerfully um, is the one that will probably come to dominate this internal representation and you will ultimately see it as a cat or a dog. Um, it's not just, by the way, the information coming from the real world. In fact, once we get to this spot, memory is also playing a role. You know, certain features, um, it's not just the fact that these features are both there in the real world, but it's that those are features of cats. And I know a lot about cats. Um, and so it makes sense that these things, so our memory of cats is now dominating what's actually out there and our memory of skunks. And so memory is starting to make this be a cat or a skunk in our mind. All right, sampling the external world consensus. Yeah, so that gets downplayed. Um, and once consensus is achieved, you perceive what you perceive. It's either a cat or a skunk. That's how it seems to you. So this is the Necker cube. This is the, this is the um, young lady, old lady thing, right? Now it may be that you can change what you see by going back to here and kind of focusing on very specific attributes. So with the Necker cube, if you want to flip it, you got to look at it and you got to really try to say, okay, I want this thing to be forward. And if you do go back to sampling and you really force that, you can flip the whole consensus that goes on here. You can change the parts and you can end up flipping the consensus. And that's kind of what's going on. This mixture of internal consensus trying to be achieved mixed with external data collection. And originally it's external data collection, which gives way to consensus, which is usually where it stops, right? You hit consensus. And things like the Necker cube or the other lady where I say, you know, take another look, do it again you can revisit whether that consensus is, is accurate or not by going back to sampling. All right. You got the sense, so let's just review where we are so far. Brain wants things to make sense. Brain um, doesn't like to fence it, right? Sees things as one way or the other. Now, let's actually, so I've been talking about this more in a perception sense and decision making, figuring out what's out there. Now let's bring it more into a memory sense. So if we think about the perception, constructing a perception based on noisy inputs from the world is actually no different than constructing a perception based on noisy data left over from past experiences. That's memory. So perception is, here's the data, it's coming through my eyes and ears. Memory, the data is coming from our memory stores. Okay, but it's the same thing. It's noisy data. Um, I mean, heck, it's based on noisy data, right? It was noisy data that came in from the world that we made sense of, but then when we store it and bring it back, we always lose some data. First of all, we don't think we even store all of the actual data to begin with. We don't encode all the actual data. And then when we try to retrieve the memory, we lose some more. So we end up with, with um, a noisy input from memory that we need to make sense of. Memory is just another source where the information comes from. So that means that a lot of the things we're talking about fit for memory too. Remember those words I showed you at the beginning? Here's eight of them. In fact, let's just focus on four of them. Here's four of them. Let me ask you this question. Were these words on that list? And how confident are you in your answer that they were or were not? Let's look at them one at a time. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do four questions here, one for each word, but I'm going to ask you to answer on a nine point scale. So I want to make sure we're all clear on this. So for example, the first one we'll do is watch. And what I'm going to say is I want you to give a one to nine where five means you don't know. You're not sure if it was on the list or not. Nine is like, oh yeah, it was on the list and I'm darn sure of it. One is, it was not on the list, and I'm darn sure of it. Okay, so think of five as the middle, and we're going to either say a yes or no, but you know, the bigger the number means a stronger yes. The lower the number means a stronger no. Is that all clear? Cool. Let's do that. So. Okay, so 
so I just spelled this out a little bit more, and that's fine. So was watch on the list? So again, you can sort of find where you are. This is just what I just said before. Actually, I think the way I said it was clearer than this, but you get the idea. Um, and so you pick one, all right. And you pick one for candle, and you pick one for bed. Now bed is gonna be one of the important ones, guys. Um, guys that are I'm doing this video for, I'll just mention it to you guys. Um, needle is also one of the important ones. Turns out, so, so I always go back to this, uh, and what we will see in the data is that for both bed and needle, uh, well, first of all, let's, let's not touch on bed and needle. First of all, let's, let's go to candle. So candle was on the list, and they will say, yes, it was on the list, and they'll be pretty confident. Um, that's what the data will show. Watch was not on the list, and they will tend to say watch was not on the list, and they will tend to be very confident. The cool ones are these two. These two are not on the list. So the right answer should be nope, they're not on the list. However, what we will find is an extremely high rate at which people will say not only that these items were on the list, but that they're really confident about it. Okay, so I, I literally have to show them the list again and say, no, look, it's not there, right? Uh, and so why does this happen? Well, we didn't present needle, but we presented a bunch of words related to needle Tetanus, stitches, yarn, thimble, cactus, shot, pierce, thread. Similarly, we did not present bed, but we presented sleep, pillow, dream, mattress, sheet, night, tired, blanket. So we, these words are actually associates. So, so how we would get these, those critical words we use is we would start with needle and we would ask people, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say the word needle? And they would give us a bunch of these. Um, and so similarly with bed, they would give us a bunch of these. And so what we're doing is we're showing at study the primary associates of this word, but we're not actually showing the word. However, when the person tries to retrieve those words, these fit, right? These fit the context of the words that, that they are able to retrieve. In fact, this is kind of suggesting a word, needle or bed, that's never shown, but because the data fit with that word so well, or I should say because those words fit the data so well, they feel like they were on the list. Um, and, and, they, and, and people will tend to be very confident. So this is kind of a freaky thing, by the way. Um, it's, it's the false memory effect, and it was, it was intentionally created, this procedure, to show that it's entirely possible for somebody to very confidently remember something that never happened. Okay, and so, you know, it's a real slap in the face of, of the accuracy of memory. But, again, it's important to think about how. So let's talk about this a little bit. First of all, Bartlett is, is a very famous guy for being one of the first to really emphasize that memory is not retrieval. We don't just store something and pull it back and look at it. We reconstruct it. Memory is an active process. Um, and when somebody hears something, they store some of those details. And then later when they try to remember it, they reconstruct the memory but they don't tend to do things accurately. They have to fill in gaps, and they tend to fill in gaps in very interesting and predictable ways. So let me just give you the story as context. So, so Bartlett was your typical British professor, rode around on his bicycle a lot, um, and one of the famous uh, things that he did is he rode around on his bicycle and he read people the, uh, a story called The War of the Ghosts. Do I have The War of the Ghosts? No, I don't. Okay. I might bring that up in a separate browser window, by the way, just to give them a sense of this story. Um, and it was, it's a story told from an American Indian perspective, uh, an indigenous kind of vibe, and, and it alludes to indigenous uh, spirituality um, and has all these references. It's a sort of stilted way of speaking. And when British people heard this story, later, when Bartlett saw them later, he would ask them to recount it. And he noticed that they're re in their recountings that, first of all, they did remember the gist, okay? They remembered the events that happened and, and sort of the story, you know, what was actually being told. Um, so in this case, it was, for example, two, two, um, uh, two members of a, of, of a tribe who joined a group of ghosts. 
that were going and having a having a fight with some other people. So they joined this battle and then they returned, told their their friends about it, and one of them dies. So just about everybody got that, you know, and that was the core of their story. However, they didn't remember a whole lot at that else well and if they were pushed to fill in the story you know tell it like a real story come on give some details don't just give me the gist give me a story then they would normalize the story and by normalize what we mean is they would make it more like the way british people told stories so for example spiritual elements would become more christian and less uh, indigenous um, and just the phrases that were used the way things were described the sorts of interactions they made more characteristic of British uh, events and interactions. So they made it make sense. They made it like the stories they had seen before. They made it match memory. Uh, and so again, just like perceiving an ambiguous thing where memory is filtering things to make them make sense, memory also filters memory. So when we try to reconstruct a memory, we only have bits of it, there's lots missing, and we use memory to fill in those parts. But we make it make sense while we do so, and so we end up normalizing the story. Interesting. Um, some implications for the law, and, and Elizabeth Loftus is, is um, very famous uh, for taking some of these issues of reconstructive memory and showing their relevance in a legal situation. So, for example, she did a study where, where people first saw this brief little movie of one car um, that was moving along and then it runs into another car. I won't, you'll see why I'm hesitating on the runs into, but it strikes another car. Um, and they, they see this movie uh, and then a while later they're asked about what they saw but the critical thing is we slightly mess with the way we ask so we could say how far was the first car going when it contacted the second car or how far was the first car going when it hit the second car or when it bumped into the second car or when it collided into the second car or when it smashed into the second car. So what you see is we're getting more and more dramatic or depending how you go, we're getting less and less dramatic with our verbs. And, um, and what you see is when people give you an estimate, they track that, okay? The way you ask a question uh, seems to affect the memory people retrieve. So that was the claim here. And I'll show you some more reason to believe that may be true. But the claim here is not only are people using those bits of data they get from memory to make sense of a memory, but also the context in which they are in now and the, and the way that they query their memory. So a lawyer will ask a question as a sort of prompt for memory retrieval. And the words that lawyer uses, the way they ask that question are critical. Now you guys know leading questions. So leading questions are extreme versions, right? Where you really suggest the answer almost to the person. Um, this is more subtle, right? This is the verbs you're using and such, and you see it's affecting the speed estimate. And but but is this you know is this just some some congruency thing, or are we actually affecting the memory that's being retrieved? Well. She also asked another question. So it turns out in reality, when these cars contacted each other, they, um, there was no broken glass. But she asked the people, was there broken glass? Did you see broken glass after the, um, after the uh, co point of contact or something? And what we see is depending on the word, so we have smashed and hit here, highlighted, because they were pretty different here. Uh, depending on the word, if you use smashed, then people were much more likely to say, yes, there was broken glass. So 16 people said there was, uh, only seven said there was when it was hit. Um, and so these are both out of 50. Um, and then in the control, um, that's, this is where you just, um, you, you ask them without this question first. So you just ask them, was there glass? So you see, they say, you know, a few people still think there was, memory is not <laughs> so great. Um, hit kind of increased that a little bit but smashed increased a lot. So the claim that's being made here is by using that word, you're changing the person's memory of the incident. When they bring it back to mind and when they ask answer questions about it, you're biasing the memory that's formed. You are part of the making sense because part of it is making it fit with the question. Here's a scary example for you, but an informative one. 
It's Donald Thompson, psychologist, memory expert, and rapist. What do I mean by that? He's Australian, um, and it turns out that there was this event in Australia um, that that um, features him. Well, sort of features him, sort of doesn't feature him. So there was a woman alone in her apartment watching television. Uh, an intruder busts into the apartment and ultimately rapes the woman and runs away. The police come over, talk to the woman. Um, did you see the person that did this to you? Yes, I saw him very clearly. I can see his face in my mind right now. Excellent. Can we bring a sketch artist over and could you guide the sketch artist through a recreation of this individual? Absolutely. I would be happy to do so. I want this sucker nail. Okay. Bring over sketch artist. They do a sketch. Hey, you know what? That sketch looks a whole lot like Don Thompson. The police have their man. They go to arrest Don Thompson. Turns out Don Thompson has an alibi. He's a, he's a memory researcher, by the way, which is kind of interesting. Um, a memory expert. But he has an alibi. He was on live television at the time of the crime. He couldn't possibly have done it. His whereabouts can be, can be nailed down absolutely clearly. He was not in the room. Right? Well, he was in the room on TV. She was watching TV just before the intruder came in. She saw his face clearly just before she was raped. Um, his face got sort of, she probably wasn't attending much to his face at the time. It was probably just sort of on TV. And somehow when she tried to remember this incident, she was, she put together that face. So that part that was in her memory somewhere got mixed up with the, with the actual assailant. And those two things got put together. That can happen with memory. It's trying to make sense of things. And, and, and his Donald Thompson's face was strong in her mind at that time. And so it made sense to her that he was the one that did it. He was darn lucky. He had an alibi in that case. Okay. Where have we gone? Brain wants things to make sense. Brain does not like to fence sit. And everything I've told you about the brain making sense and fence sitting in the context of things like perception, um, et cetera, coming in also applies in the context of um, memory. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to answer this in front of you because what the hello? Probably a duct cleaner. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the final point. We're going to bring in making decisions and making sense now that we have all this. So the same process that the brain is using to make sense of noisy experiences, ones that come from perception and memory, is also what it uses to make decisions based on noisy data. All right, let's get in here. So when you are sitting in the courtroom and we come back to this judicial hunch and you're being exposed to information, that's the information coming in from the external world. And as it's coming in, your mind will form a perception of what's going on. Parts of what comes in will connect with things you've seen before in cases where you ultimately felt the person was guilty. Other parts will connect with things you've seen before in cases where you ultimately thought the person was innocent. But once again, the brain does not like to sit in a situation where it's thinking both guilty and innocent at the same time. That same consensus process will creep in. And so if you allow it, at some point in time, your sampling of the external data will decrease. Your attention to what's going on, the degree to which you're thinking about every word that you're hearing and everything that you're coming in will become less important than the stuff you already got in there and trying to make sense of it. And so these consensus processes will start to try to organize what you've seen and it will push you towards seeing things as guilty or innocent. So you cannot fence it. You fall into one or you fall into the other. Um, and if you allow this to happen, if you just allow it to continue, it will be just like perception where, where input from the external world will be downplayed more and more and more over time. This consensus process will become more and more dominant over time and you'll start to see things a certain way. In fact, there's a, a really nasty thing that'll kind of happen. Um, And that surprised me when I saw it. I'm like, what the heck was I thinking there? It's something called confirmation bias. So, so 
something that's very important is once we start to think we see things in a certain way, it's not just the case that we downplay the sampling. It's in fact more insidious than that. We start to look for things in the external data that fit with what we already believe. And we start to ignore things that don't fit. So once this falls into something guilty, then if we're hearing more and that's like, oh yeah, that sounds guilty too, that sounds. So the, the new evidence that also fits with that guilty notion seems really important to us. And the stuff that doesn't fit so much, it's not so much that we actively ignore it or whatever, it just doesn't fit. And so it's kind of like we got no place for it and so we let it go away. Okay, and so this is called confirmation bias. Uh, is Donald Trump the champion of the poor? Um, so, so how much do you agree with that, that Donald Trump is the champion of the poor? I'm trying to think what I was thinking when I put this example in, but we'll see. Um, so I'm suspecting people are going to see, say disagree very strongly, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, <laughs> and so now I'm going to have to know what I'm, what I'm thinking. Oh, I know what, I, I know what I'm thinking. Okay, so, sorry. <laughs> Psychologists really find Donald Trump amazing because a lot of the phenomenon that we talk about we didn't, didn't think could be stretched as far as he stretches them. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is some people love Donald Trump in America. And, and some people think he's a complete whack job. Those who think he's a complete whack job are continually trying to understand how the people who love him can continue to love him. And that's because they believe things like this. That he is the champion of the poor. And then when, when they see all this data, what's he throwing out there? He's saying lowest unemployment rate forever for, for African-Americans, minorities, um, et cetera. So there's all this data coming out, um, but there's certain bits of data that, that those people latch onto because it fits. See, he's helping us get jobs. Oh, look how he's like, you know, what, what some people see as bullying. No, no, that's fighting. He's fighting. He's a fighter and he's giving us jobs. And, he's, and so they find the aspects of what he does that fit with what they want to believe. Um, often something they've argued for a long time, right? They've kind of taken that position and they're entrenched. Again, it's very hard to flip somebody once they're in a position. Um, and so they will continue to find that data. And that's the biggest reason why this 40% just won't disappear. It just won't reduce. Um, it's, a, it's just a, a powerful example of what that confirmation bias is doing. Okay, so what do we do about all this? You know, I've painted you this picture of your judicial hunches is, is just going to eat you alive if you allow it to, in a sense. Well, Karl Popper, this issue has been faced by science. Um, in fact, many scientific theories, when they originally came on, somebody had an idea. Ah, I think this is, this is how something works. And, and because of this and this and this, this, look, you can see the evidence. It, it all fits everything I say. Um, that's confirmation bias. It's easy to do. Karl Popper came along at some point and said, that's useless. What we need to do is look at the data that doesn't fit. That's where the power is. Um, so he's talking about confirmation bias here. True ignorance is not the absence of knowledge, but the refusal to acquire it. He says if you fall into the trap of confirmation bias, if once you're in a certain position, you only look for the stuff that'll keep you in there, um, that's bad news. That's a problem. And, and so he said that to science. And so the famous example that you've probably heard is um, in Britain at the time, there was a widespread belief that all swans are white. And if you asked anybody, you know, are all swans white? They would say, yeah, look, there's one, there's one, there's one, they're all white. Um, and he would say, well, but does that prove they're all white? And they say, well, everyone I see is white, so they're all white. Uh, and then somebody went to China where apparently there are quite a few black swans. And so what Carl says is you only need to see one. One black swan tells you that all swans are white is incorrect. And this black swan is way more powerful in helping you reach the truth than all of those white ones. <clears throat> you have to learn to attend to the things that don't fit if something you believe is true. And you have to learn not to ignore it. You have to do the opposite of confirmation bias. You have to attend to those aspects that don't fit. So 
What does this mean for the judicial hunch? You have to fight this downplay, downplaying of external information by consciously attending to it, whether it fits or doesn't, um, with your current hypothesis. So you, when, when you start to feel you know, your attention waning or you're, you're sort of pulling back from that stream of information, you have to fight that and, and focus on it, especially, especially with your antenna up and say, oh, I'm kind of thinking guilty and you're not going to be able to help that. You know, that that's your mind will do that. I'm kind of thinking guilty, but that's weird. Okay, I didn't expect to hear that. Or I didn't expect this. And I know in court cases, sometimes it's different whether you have the, the opportunity to mine some bit of information further or not, whether you can ask questions or, or whatnot. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to attend to it and think about it. But if you did have a chance to actually mine anything a little bit more, that unexpected information is where the action lies. That's the Karl Popper thing, okay? Um, so that's, you know, my one little bit of, of, of uh, advice to you, I guess, is once you understand what this process is doing, you can fight it a little bit. Um, and, and the biggest way of fighting it is to attend to the information that doesn't fit. The other thing you guys do that I think is fantastic uh, and follows the same one is that you have to write up your decision afterwards. And I've heard from judge after judge the power that comes from you know, this simple phrase, the decision won't write, that every now and then you're trying to give the rational justification for why you came to the opinion you did. And you find you're having trouble doing that. Um, and, and when that's true, that sort, sort of suggests that maybe those internal forces won out. Maybe your head got snapped into a certain verdict at some point, And for whatever reason, um, you, you weren't able to come out of that verdict. But now when you try to describe why you're there, you can't really do that as well as you'd like. And so, you know, that's a situation where once again, if you can revisit the data from the trial, if you have that available to you, scour it looking for data that doesn't fit with the verdict that you wanted to make and really think about that data and, and think about whether it may be exculpatory, um, you know, and, and et cetera. So it's, it's sort of the same conclusion in another, in another way. I think I followed up. Yeah. So the last thing I want to hit at is just like there's habits, the habits of everything. Um, there's habits of the mind. Uh, and so a problem is, you know, I can tell you, hey, attend to the input and, and do this. But if you already have developed a habit of not doing that, not looking for because the things I'm telling you to do are not natural to begin with. And so it's natural for you to not have a habit of looking for exculpatory data like that, for example. Um, so what we want to do is build this, the stuff I described as a habit. We want to bring them in early, I would say, in the judge's education. Um, so here's a suggestion I have. Here's something to throw out. I'm big on education and, and using a technology to do it. Imagine you created some mock scenarios in which exculpatory evidence um, is or is not buried within other evidence that points to a certain outcome. Okay, uh, and so maybe we ask students to do this. So create some mock scenarios, describe this whole thing, describe the data, and we give them the challenge of doing this. Why, why would we give them the challenge of doing this, by the way? Sometimes the best way to recognize something is to have produced it yourself. When you kind of produce this sort of situation, and you, you can kind of get the characteristics. How can I bury the data so it's not so seen, the sculptory part and blah, blah, blah. Now they get better at actually looking for it as well. So we might ask students to create that. And okay, here's, here's I'm gonna create two, one that has hidden exculpatory uh, evidence, one that doesn't, I'm gonna submit them. And then I'm a big fan of peer assessment. So once you do that, now the students see the other people's scenario and they decide a verdict and they write it up. So they get a practice of, of writing this thing. And then the original students see their peers' decision. So I wrote these two things, and now I'm going to see what my fellow students thought about these two things. Did they find my hidden evidence? Was I able to trick them? Um, and if I was, you know, was I able to produce wrong verdicts? So this sort of educational process early in a judge's career, I think could really train their mind um, to see the significance of, of data that doesn't fit. I'm using the strong word exculpatory, and I really shouldn't be using, you know, exculpatory really suggests that they're innocent. Uh, and, and I shouldn't be saying that per se. 
Uh, but I should be saying it's data you should think about more because it doesn't fit with the guilty. If, and, you know, I'm assuming somebody's leaning towards the guilty. I just realized that too. So the bigger point I'm making with all this is, is this sort of education process going on could really train students um, to, to sh control their sampling of external information in certain ways. And, and it can allow them to see the issue clearly, the problem that can happen, and practice their mind looking for this, this problem. Uh, and so, you know, I would I would love to work with uh, with whoever does the training of judges on, on a process like this. I think it would be fantastic. A little pitch for me. All right. So uh, these are just yeah my last thing. So I'm just curious what you thought of this. My goal was to deepen your understanding of your mind, human memory, and how they influence decision making. How did I do? Eh, just go ahead and vote and, and let me know um, what you think of all this. Okay. Thank you very much. These are just a couple of extra slides I have in case people ask about deja vu. Just one in particular. To give a memory talk, people ask about deja vu. I don't know why. Okay, that's all I got for you guys. I'm not sure how long I was talking. Hour and 10 minutes. Okay, so if it's a 90 minute talk, then we have about 40 minutes of, uh, of uh, chat time, if that stays right. Okay, cool. I'll stop there. Bye-bye.